<laughs> Welcome to You're On In Five, The Art of Understudying. The only podcast to celebrate the work of actors in understudy roles. Understudying demands tons of preparation with minimal rehearsal. Or sometimes none at all. But it can end in triumphant glory. In these conversations, we'll amplify the diverse voices of actors who have understudied. We want to hear about the artist's technique, experience, and journey. As well as whatever's on our mind that day. I'm your host, Elani Elise. So good to be back for season three. Hey, um, yeah. you might know me from nothing because I haven't acted in a long time, but I promise y'all I'll do it again. Please. <laughs> uh, I'm Scott Saba. I am the co-host of the show. You might know me from Doobie Doobie Moo at Lifeline Theater. If you have a kid, uh, you might have brought them to that show in November. Our guest today is Juan Villa. You might know him from his solo show, Empanada for a Dream. Juan, welcome to the show. <laughs> welcome to hey, the show. Thank you. Oh, I, I didn't know what you were going to say that people might know me from, but yes, that's a good one. That's a yeah. very good one. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty special when somebody writes their own show. It is. Yeah, yeah, and, and a lot of work, and I love helping others because I, I know how hard it is, how difficult it is to do and what it takes, and I admire anyone who just puts their story out there. Oh, that's awesome. So <laughs> we always start the show on with the same question, and that is, what was your very first understudy gig? Uh, yeah, my um, very first understudy gig, uh, I was the reason I moved to Chicago. I moved to Chicago um, when I was 25 um, to work at Steppenwolf Theater. Uh, not even the Goodman, uh, not Victory Gardens, not all these other theaters. It was about Steppenwolf Theater. Um, and I had just moved and I was submitting like crazy. What was what was that? I, I feel like I've heard it on your show. What was it was it called the the book or the the, the it was something where they had the list. Mm -hmm. This is pre internet. This is pre Al Gore being born. Where there, there, there was no internet. There was a book <laughs> where it had a list of all the the people, all the um uh, the agents, uh, theaters, all this oh. stuff. And there was also what was it called? Per it's not performing. Performing. Access. Performing. That's, That's the one. one. Performing, yeah. and there was a, 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 a they had put down a, a breakdown of um of understudying for uh, Our Lady of 121st Street by Stephen Ali Girgis, uh, directed by Will Frears, who's the son of Stephen Frears. Um, and uh, I had no idea who any of those people were, uh, but <laughs> I was like, great, Steppenwolf. Um, I it was about un it was about auditioning. And so I went in, uh, I got lost uh, because I, it's not the case anymore. They had the office across the street. I don't know if you remember. And then they had the theater. It was like in a different location. Mm -hmm. And I went to the office. And so I went there and then everything was closed because it was like a Monday and I don't know what was going on. And I ran into a woman who saw me struggling at, uh, in the office building. And I said, she's like, oh, may I help you? I said, "Oh yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to find where Steppenwolf Theater is. I, I, I'm I'm trying to I gotta go, got this audition, and she's like, oh sure, I can I can help you.' And she started asking me questions, and I said, "Yeah, I'm here for uh, Our Lady of the Twenty First Street." She's like, "Oh yes, we're very excited about Stephen Ali Girgis." I said, "Yeah, I don't I don't really know him, but I had left New York City. I grew up there." Um, but I did some research online. I'm like, holy shit. And I'm like talking, I'm just going crazy. And then she's like, well, here it is. Here it is. Um, you can just go right in and uh, the audition will be there. And I was like, oh, great. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate it. She's like, oh, uh, yeah. Um, my name is Martha Levy. Uh, <laughs> thank you. For it. And I was like, awesome. Great. I don't know who you are, but I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And I made myself a researcher and all of a sudden I don't even fucking know who's the artistic director. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the name I remembered was Erica Daniels. So I didn't, mm -hmm. I just, um, I said in our, in, in, before we started recording that I'm a technophobe and I didn't have a laptop. I did not have a desktop. I, and I just, 
I would have to go to an internet cafe and like sit there for a while. Um, or if I'm dating someone, I use their their laptop <laughs> or computer. Sure. So yeah. that was my that was my introduction to uh, the brick and mortar Steppenwolf Theater meeting Martha Levy without knowing who she was and then going in and auditioning um, for Eddie and Pinky. And, um, and I, and I actually felt pretty good about it, but I was a newbie. I gave myself five years to get on the step off stage. I was like five years. It's going to take a while. That's all right. And, um, they called me back and I was just ecstatic at the time I was taking, I started taking Meisner classes, um, with Eileen Vorbach and Ted Oral. Um, and so I was doing that. I had found a place of just really understanding myself and trusting myself. And then they didn't offer me the role. And Erica Daniel said, are you interested in um, understudying? And they had a whole thing where you check off if you're interested. And of course, I'm like, of course, yes, I'm, I will. I will. I was that person at that age where I will clean your bathrooms. I will do all these things, which <laughs> looking back, I would never tell someone to yeah. approach it that way. <laughs> but when I, at that age, that uh, being new, I was like, yes, that's what you do. Mm-hmm. You work your way literally from the shitter all the way up, you know. And so um, I said yes, and I was ecstatic and because I didn't really know many people in Chicago. Um, I moved to Chicago without knowing anyone. And um, I started uh, rehearsals, and I made uh, a lot of friends. Um, we started, and what I will remember a lot of is we partied a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And I say that, I say that, uh, um, what was her name? Deb. Deb was the stage manager. Deb, I can't remember her last name, but I think she's still there. White hair. Um, and um, we parted a lot, the cast and the understudies. I'm telling you guys, it was, it was bad in the sense of coming to rehearsals. Like we were, the understudies were going to a lot of the rehearsals mm-hmm. that it went, it got so bad. We had a sit down. The stage manager, Deb, had a sit down with us uh, because uh, they told us that we have to stop hanging out together because we were partying till late and the, the, the regular cast members were coming in hungover or exhausted, even if they weren't drinking, exhausted. And it was just, it was a problem. Like they weren't able to get their shit done. And me being like Steppenwolf, and this is why I moved here. I got freaked out of my mind. Um, and you know, it's easier sometimes for understudy. The, the scenes that I had, they were pretty straightforward. It was like monologue, monologue, some scenes, but nothing super complicated, even in blocking. So I was scared out of my mind, but we acquiesced. We were like, we totally get it. Um, and we laid off. And uh, then we get into previews and we're all like a really big family. Uh, in all the good ways and bad ways. <laughs> we're fighting, we're getting along, yeah. we're celebrating each other, we're there for each other. Um, and then we had a potluck on the last day of previews. We had a matinee and we had an evening show. And so everyone chose what they're going to bring. And then we're all eating, we're all eating, having a good time. And then uh, Eddie Martinez, he's like, he comes out and he's like, hey, um... Is is who brought the mole? Uh, because is there peanuts in the mole? And we're like, oh no, uh, I don't know. And then we got into this conversation about is there a peanut oil? It, or like some people put chocolate, some people put peanuts. And we got into this conversation. And the next time I look at Eddie, his eyes had like swollen big. He's like, I'm allergic to peanuts. And everyone looks at me, and I'm like, I didn't fucking bring anything, so <laughs> no, it was not me. <laughs> And I didn't know he was allergic at the time. And uh, and so they had to rush him out uh, in the ambulance because uh, they didn't have a, the, the pen or any of that stuff. He didn't have his his pen either. And uh, is it an EpiPen? Is that what it's called? EpiPen, yes. EpiPen, excuse me. And um, and so then I was like, oh my God, this is, uh, this is about an hour before curtain, about that much. And they were like, all right, you're up and i was like what <laughs> we hadn't had any rehearsals because that's how it usually is at steppenwolf because we hadn't opened yet rehearsals oh. start when you open mm-hmm. so in theory in the contract um it's show up to the first day show up to tech be there for previews 
be there for opening and then like they re- rehearse maybe once twice a week depending on how well we're all doing mm-hmm. it's it's what says on the contract i'm sure there's an unspoken agreement of you gotta be here more often just in case shit goes down like that day and so they were like all right we're just gonna walk you through the blocking and i at that point had never set foot on the stage you know i was in the, i was in the audience or in the booth watching uh and they're like, all right, here we go. And I had dreamed of this moment of walking on stage at Steppenwolf Theater. And I walk on stage and they're like, yeah, your first entrance is going to be here. And then I look out and I just said, oh, this is just a theater. Like, <laughs> it, was, it was this moment where it wasn't yes. like any magical moment. It, it, it was not mythical at all. It, was, it felt mm-hmm. like the audience was right here. As opposed to when I'm sitting in the audience Mm. where it feels like it's so far and it's like, they feel like they're right here and it's just a stage. And I said, Oh, okay. 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 I can do this because I had the voice that was, that's been a a long-term battle battle. That was like, who the fuck do you think you are? Mm. Yeah. Who do you think you are? I grew up in Lower East Side. You uh, had a plus grades. And so you started doing theater and you you learn some things in your family that made you just go like this is all bullshit none of this works none of this makes sense so your grades plummeted then you got into college barely and then you actually failed out a freshman year and you were avoiding telling your parents so who the fuck do you think you are and then you you went back sure they took you back and they put you on academic probation that you didn't know about but you decided to do the work do the grunge work but you barely you didn't even graduate on time you did not even graduate on time. You had to stay to summer classes because of all the classes you failed. This is how much you don't deserve to be here. You didn't even get to fucking grad school. You got waitlisted at a couple of places. So what, who do you think you are? And then in that moment, that was like, that voice was like, oh, I got this. This is just a scene. And people mm-hmm. just got to hear me. And that's it. <laughs> and, they're, and they said, they encouraged me to have the script in my head. They're like, you might feel okay, but just hold it in your hand in case anything. And I fought them on it. And I said, all right, fine. You know what? Yes, I'm just going to hold it in my hand. And we went on. And of course, it was all a blur. And I'm, of course, like going over my things. But it's like, I have it. Like, I knew. I was like, I have this. And did my scene, intermission. Everyone's being very positive. Uh, did the second half of the play. It was over. Everyone was very supportive. And uh, and then Eddie walked in. And I was like, oh, shit. And he was not swollen anymore. He was like, man, that was awesome to watch you do that. And of course, in my head, I don't know when Showgirls came out, but you know, it was one of those <laughs> where I'm like, I got very like defensive. I'm like, I, I, I didn't know. I didn't put any, I didn't bring any mole. I didn't. And he's like, no, dude, I know. I know. Don't worry about it. it it's, it's all good. Like, you're fine. He's like, it was good to see you. I was like, awesome. Thank you, man. He's like, I, he had gone back. He probably could have gone on, but they just were like, let's, let's just like, just keep it safe we don't know if if you'll be fine in a half hour better to just go clean um and, and then that was it and that was like my first time on stage at steppenwolf theater first time i understudied uh and it was definitely you know artistic blue balls like it was definitely a thing that i just was like i don't know if i could do this again and then i auditioned for the goodman theater uh for uh, electricidad by luis alfaro and uh, the henry godinez was directing and the same thing, Henry said some very nice things, had a callback. And it was because, I, you know, I've never asked Max this, Maximino, if he was, if he had just shot Breaking Bad, because there, he had just moved to LA. And he, it was, there was a, like the possibility that he was not going to be back to do the play because it was a summer play. So I don't know when Breaking Bad was shooting. Um but he, there was this thing of like, we don't know if he's going to come back, uh, but uh, we'll let you know if, if we're going to cast him. If not, are you interested in understudying? And that one was Alden. Alden Vasquez was the stage manager. And I I believe I carried this cockiness from the other experience. And I thought I had done really well in these auditions too. And I was like, why? I don't understand why I didn't get it. <laughs> that was my my mindset. <laughs> Right. And then I met and then I saw Maximino and I saw what he did. And I was like, oh yeah, okay. I, I I mean, yeah, we're not better than each other. It's just different takes. 
oh, so he knows people. Like this thing, this other ego thing was happening. Mm. But I was like, chill out. And everyone was just so loving. Uh, the the is almost all Teatro Vista members. Mm. And they were just very, very inviting uh, and giving and uh, just really loving. And I fell in love with this company, with these group of people. And uh, Alden was uh, was tough. But tough with love, always giving us shit, keeping us in check, but always he's not waiting to see if because he's Latino. He's not waiting. He's not there's not this sometimes when it's a different race, especially if it's like white and black or brown, there can sometimes be a divide, potentially. Sometimes. But if it's like same, there can be a shorthand that's like very quick and you're just like in it's like you all know each other. And again, that can have its pros and cons. But he was just like immediately just like, I can talk to you guys this way. And he had a history of all of them. So I was new and I'm like, what is happening here? Which prepped me for when I worked with Che, you know, just someone yeah. who's just like, whap, 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 just whipping yes. that whip. Um, and so uh, I everything was going great. It's the first time I shaved my head. I was definitely afraid of going bald because my father was bald in his 30s. I shaved my head. I was like, that's not too bad. Actually, I'll be all right if I lose all my hair. And and then we had a, I made every rehearsal. Everything was going great. We were all partying. We were. Uh, but they were on top of their, they were on top of their shit. Um, and then it came to a designer run through for the understudies. And I was exercising for the first time in my life. And I... It was for a large part of my life. I always found a way to somehow self-sabotage. Like there was this thing with me that it's like, I did that or it's not my fault. It was this, you know, reasons, reasons, reasons. But there was a pattern that it was happening a lot. And in that one, there was time changes and I just didn't log it. I didn't have my spreadsheet. You know, I didn't have my, <laughs> I didn't have any of that stuff that made me organize. I was just like, I'll remember. I'm proud of it. I have a good memory. And I somehow didn't log it properly. And I'm at Bally's Fitness, like right downtown uh, uh, in Chicago. And in the, over the speakers, it was like, Juan Francisco Villa, are, are you in the building? And I was like, what? And they had, <laughs> Alden was on the phone. He's like, where are you? We have a designer run through. I ran so fucking fast and I was embarrassed. I think I was maybe, maybe a half hour late. Maybe Luis was going to watch other people. Other people were going to watch. Uh, Adam Belcar was going to watch because he had cast me in that. And I, I did great, but they were, that was enough for them to just go. Who the fuck are you? Like, why yeah. were you not there? And Alden, Alden gave me a a really a real heart to heart of just of getting my shit together, mm. being on top of things and saying positive things like, "Hey man, you're a good person. You have no malintention. You're not purposely trying to do anything wrong. But what? Like you you can't do this if you're trying to be taken serious here. You can't just be not here for your run through." And so you got to figure out if you want to make this a career or not. Like you get, and I've had those people have given me those talks over the years. Mm. I've had, so it's not a, well, this is the first time ever. It's a Juan and only I would know this has happened more than once. Like you've got to snap out of it, snap out of this. I know we talked earlier about inner child stuff. And for me, it was, it was this like childlike thing that I, I refused to do the next thing of being more organized of my things. And I started having a, a planner after that. I like had to do it. I, I, there was no, I didn't have one at that point. Um, so those are, those are the, the, the two shows that I did. Um, I don't know. It might've been six months apart from the end of one play uh, uh, to the next. And, and I just said, I was like, I'm never going to do this again. I, I just. The understudying. Yeah, I said that, and only like last year uh, have I opened it up to being like, get over yourself. Like, if it's the right project, if it's Broadway, if it's a play I really love, like, do it, do it, <clears throat> do it. It's okay, but but it has to like whatever check off things that 
makes sense. And the big thing is that if my if my gut and my heart, everything says yes. Yeah. Well, that's also the way we should choose even principal roles, really. Like all of those same boxes should be checked. So so that's so so then so far you have not understudied again yet. Um I believe I had overlapped the Goodman Theater, because I was also doing um a sketch improv group called Salsation. It was like Chicago's first and only let them very familiar. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I and I worked with them. And actually I met Eddie Martinez there before our Lady of the 21st Street. Because mm-hmm. I replaced him in a in 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 the show. So technically I was like understudying him while he was in it. And then he left and I took over his roles so we were all understudying each other each other yeah. where it'd say hey jump in and so then uh, it was my big fat quinceanera and then uh, that's how i met tanya i met tanya saracho there uh doing at a theater in pilsen and then we did another show called the fanta menace and that overlapped <laughs> that came up after her, the electricidad and so then that was my last time understanding it was like the same thing sketch improv you understudy each other and then that was done, and then I haven't done it since. So it's been, it's maybe been eighteen years, or something yeah. like that, um, since I've uh, done it. That's so interesting. I was I've been told by a director before when like I had a particular situation where this one theater thought I would understudy for them twice back to back. <laughs> um, and so just um, every time I think about it, it's just like, well, and so I was, you know, talking about that, and and he said, "You're not an understudy actor," and I yes. was like, "See, that's the thing that that there's a there's a reason we think that, right?" Yeah. But much like in our with the inception of the show, some of the conversations that Scott and I had, the reality is, an understudy actor is an actor. Right. So like there is, yes. there is not, there is, I, I would never say I will never understudy. Right. Cause there are those boxes that could be checked. Like there was a, the, the show that I understudied at that theater, like I definitely wanted to be in it, but the, it, but I loved it so much. I loved it, loved it. And then um, all half my friends were in it. And I was like, I'm, I'm getting in where I fit in. You know, I'm gonna under, and then they asked, you know, the, it, the same circumstances weren't true for the following show they asked me to do. And, you know, I haven't understudied since, but not, you know, because like Goodman has, has been reaching out, but I haven't been available um, as sick parents, um, you know, so, but I, I thought that was interesting, right? Because there is that instinct to agree, but every actor thinks they're a principal. We never yes. got into it to understand. Yes. We never got yeah. into it to be yes. second tier, you know? And so what does it mean? to? It's a, but it's about how others view like I, why I, this is the other reason I stopped was someone told me, careful, if you do too many of them, they'll only look at you as an understudy, where they can rely on you to do that. And I was like, what? Why? Like what? It's like it. Trust me. Like it's a thing. And I have a good like three, at least three friends. I don't think they would ever come on the show because they something they've been wrestling figuring out because it's 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 work and mm-hmm. if they need the money they need the money if they need the equity points for health they need the equity points and they've done it i mean i could say like at least 12 14 15 times and i've always checked in where i'm like you sure you want to you do it again and they're like what else do i got it's like uh, but there's the thing if you don't leave the door open and maybe <clears throat> go through this anxiety of like, oh my God, I should have taken that job. There's no room for nothing else to come in because they're also not the type of person who will leave the job to take right. the job because they're taking, and, and you could all talk about the the background of, I'd be curious just because I haven't listened to all the episodes of everyone that's been on this podcast, if they've grown up in an environment where they are caretakers. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, where it's about, I want to make sure everyone is okay. I want to make sure everyone is getting along. I want to make sure everything works out because, because the people who stayed longer doing the understudying stuff a lot more than the principal stuff, there is a, there is a thing where in their families or they grew up that there is this thing of, they were made to forced or put in a position 
to have to mm-hmm. take care of folks or rely, people have to rely on you. And I definitely fit that mold. And I would say at least four of my friends who've done it consistently fit that mold. See, that's super interesting. I have a little bit of that. I'm more, I'm more that now, but um, in terms of them not leaving the door open, I think that's really important. And, you know, hopefully they will come to that or people listening, you know, recognize that because when I didn't have a show when they called me that second time and I almost I laughed in the ear of the caller, I stopped myself and I said, I fully intend to have a show. I had nothing on the horizon, yes. but I said yes. that. And then, and the show that I got was United Flight 232. I saw you in that freaking and amazing I would have, you know, if I had agreed mm-hmm. to understudy, I would have never even auditioned for United yes. Flight because I had a job, you know, yes. but I, I didn't, I was just like, I know what my intentions are and it's not to understudy, you know? So like, I can't imagine having yes. missed out on this amazing project. So but what I was the impulse? Know. What was the impulse to say that? To say, well, because I'm not going to, don't ask me back to back to understudy. Like, that, it was just in and of itself, right? Like, mm-hmm. that, that was your boundary. thing, that moment, like, I, I'm not going to do this right again for you. And and I, it wasn't even thinking, like, I'll never do this for this theater again. Nothing like that. It's like, no, I just, I just did that. Now I'm going to go not do that. Like, I'm going to do something <laughs> different. Like, that's it, you know? And I had never been asked to do so back to back like that. Like it just, it seemed absurd to me. And I think that unknowingly or subconsciously like that idea of them seeing me as only worth that is possible. Like that may have been in play, but it wasn't a conscious thought. I, but but ultimately that's what it comes down to. Like, I think it's really weird that you would ask me to understudy the very next show from the one that I just understudied. I just thought it was weird and I wasn't going to do it. And so after the flight production, did that influence when, did I adjust when you say yes to any understudy gig after that? Um, After that, I, there, there was, I was, I was just having principal roles. I, you know. So I, things like, like it, it wasn't just one show, like things started boom, 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 well, boom, yeah. boom, boom, boom. Well, yeah, because I was, that, cause that right. wasn't, it wasn't like that understudy job that I accepted was like, I had been on a string of understudy. I've actually understudied, I can count on one hand, um, you know, but so I've been, and there have been times where I, you know, especially with storefront where maybe I, I wasn't interested in, in understudying because I'm just going to like try and find something else. So I had already, had I had been working steadily, not understudying. So I didn't have any reason to be in the mind of like, I gotta pay my dues or this is my way in or whatever. Like I'm I'm going from show to show to show to show, sometimes doing a bit too much over like like opening a show and starting rehearsals the very next day for the next one, you know? So I already had this kind of nice flow. Um and so it made sense to me that I could not have anything on the horizon, but believe I would have a show I'd prefer to do over understudying. And then if I, but even if I hadn't gotten a show, I still would have been free to continue to audition to, for things that were more interesting to me. Well, quality um, time with friends, family, like any, anything like that, just, uh, and, and that's, and that, I think that was also part of me setting that boundary that has only shifted, in the la- like I said, last year, where I'm willing to understudy a show here in LA but like you said, I apply the same rule of it has to be a, a role, a character, or people that I really want to to work with, and also Broadway, like uh, uh, Cost of Living with Martina Majak. I had saw, I had seen an MTC production of it. Screamed to anyone who I spoke to, you have to produce this play. You have to produce this play, and people were not biting on it. It, it requires uh, two different abled actors, mm-hmm. and so that's its own challenge Mm -hmm. and then it got the Pulitzer (laughs) it got the Pulitzer and then it's picked up it was just on Broadway I I saw it here in LA at the Fountain Theater and uh, just that role and I was like I want to understudy this I want to do this play but I will understudy it on Broadway if it comes up and they had already made their choices by the time I I found out about it but um I I want to do that play anywhere because there's something about that character, that role, that writing that is consistent with her, all her plays, Sanctuary City, um, uh, Queens, I think it's called Queens Boulevard. Um, and she's now writing the book for the Great Gatsby musical, the music being done by Florence and the uh, machine. 
Yeah. Anyways, oh. but but that thing <laughs> of like, I just was like, no, I, 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 it's for the work, so I will understudy for the for the right thing. But boy, does it have to be. But I've also had to accept that I will pull out of it if something else comes up. I mean, it's also the other side of it because because in Chicago. Uh, unfortunately there was a mindset that I, I took in and said yes to, which is you have to do this $200 stipend play and never Ooh. miss a performance for a, but at the time I didn't know what it, what, what you got paid, uh, even though I was SAG for a p- potential thousand dollar a day co-star or a, uh, um, uh, you know, two to three thousand dollar a day guest star, or a top of show guest star, ten thousand dollars a week. You cannot. That's <laughs> no. not what you do. If you're a real artist, a Chicago artist, mm-hmm. you don't do that. And so, I fell for that. Mm-hmm. I went for it with pride, and then I ten years ago, my Joe Minoso. I don't know if you guys know Joe Minoso. He's uh, he's been on Chicago Fire since season one, but oh, he's yeah. a Teatro Vista member. He's done a shit ton of theater. He got cast and he was like, hey, come on set. And I was like, oh, I don't know. Self-worth low, self-worth low. I don't know if I deserve it. <laughs> He's like, get over yourself. Get Come over here. So we get on, on set. And I, I the same thing as Steppenwolf, I'm realizing as I'm talking to you. I was like, oh, oh, this is a set? Like, even though I've done commercials, <laughs> I had never done episodic work. I I was like, oh, oh, he's like, yeah, uh, he broke down for me all the stuff that I just said. He's like, well, you know, you get a thousand dollars if you get a co-star. I was like, what? You mean like five lines or less? He's like, yeah. I was like, they pay you a thousand dollars? He's like, yeah. And I was like, he said, well, then that's not as much as guest star. I was like, well, what's guest star? Because it sounds fancy. And he said, you know, it could be twenty five hundred, five thousand. Like it's you no know, negotiated a day. I was like, what? For a guest star? He's like, well, or top of show guest star. It's like, wait, what's that? <laughs> and then he broke down $10,000 a week. And then, and he said season regular, he's like 25000 uh, an episode uh, minimum. Minimum $25,000. And when he said that to me, like uh, uh, like the stuff when I, uh, uh, when I was younger with my, my family, I had a moment where I was like, everything's a lie. I <laughs> fell for it. I fell for it. And I have made, I've romanticized, I've fallen for the romant, romanticization of being a starving artist. Mm. Yeah. and uh, Or being, at the time, I still drank, being an alcoholic, mm. an artist. I've been sober for over nine years now, but I, I wasn't yeah. then. And it's, it was like, I cannot believe I let the industry tell me that I cannot miss work for this sh- play for a thing that pays more, even though it is it can, it can be in our contracts, I'm already. I've had friends who are in a play at reputable storefront theaters and, they, and they're like, hey, so I got this recurring thing. Um, they wanna see if I'm available, uh, but it falls on, one of the days falls on tech. And they're like, oh no, you can't miss tech. You can't miss tech. You're getting two hundred dollars before taxes uh, a week. You can't miss tech. You can't miss tech. And he's like, "What? Like it's one day. I'm making everything else." So they fire him, and he's like, "He has no problem." He was just like, "I'm good." And I started hearing stories from other people, usually people who leave Chicago, who just get out of this mentality, this group mentality of what you're supposed to do. And I've seen careers of people just go in direction they're making more money mm-hmm. and and they're doing more things which make them more attractive for theaters yeah <laughs> and so and then and just myself just like i i had to say no to theater after i did a play at the geffen theater i was like i need to take a long break from theater and not knowing that the pandemic was coming which forced another a longer break and i got to learn that holy shit am i an ang- anxious person mm-hmm. i have a now that I don't have a play to memorize lines, to figure out character stuff, to maybe have an outlet for my neuroticism, for my anger, for my uh, sensitivity, I have to deal with it myself. And I don't like myself. Right oh. now. <laughs> and then I had to work through that of just yeah. like, okay, like time to get to know who you are without it being that my identity is solely being a theater actor. 
Yeah. And it's been, and then the pandemic happened and it was like a whole other level. And I have, I am grateful for that time because I've learned that I am more than a theater actor and I have a deeper appreciation for theater. And whenever I do it, whether it's a reading or something like that, it, it, I am, it comes with all of me as opposed to what I was turning into, which is, and these are actors I saw when I was in my twenties, someone in their forties or older who was really bitter. And they are, they're talking about people that they knew who are on TV and film or on magazine covers <clears throat> or an award season. And they talk about how they were with them or they helped them with this. I, I do a lot of coaching also. And so that's, I love working with people and helping them get into this, that, or the other. And while I'm, you know, scrambling and uh, I think, I think I put that in the bio of my general hospital episode will mm -hmm. start airing um, on Thursday. Cause I'll tell you soap opera actors, this is a whole other world of craft. Like I was warned of how fast they work. I have the deepest respect for them. It is seven scenes an hour that you do two episodes a day a hundred pages are shot in a day which is where tyler perry gets his his uh formula from that's where he gets oh. it. The, con the concept is that it's soap opera concept and they and you get one take you get one take you go through blocking so that the camp is really blocking for the cameras there's like four cameras going and then they're like okay baba and then when you i mean for uh, the first day i was like what is happening it's like it's tech, but imagine tech is five minutes, <laughs> and then you then you go, and yeah. it was a uh, uh, if if they keep my stuff in there, I will just look like this, like oh my god, I have to <laughs> get these lines right, I have to get these lines right, I have no point of view, I'm just saying things. <laughs> I, I had two hiccups, and they did an audio pickup where they were just like, just say this one sentence, we'll just pick it up by audio, we'll have the camera on. When we go to it, we'll edit it that we choose the shot that is on someone else while we put the audio in. And then they did one shot pickup for one line. And then that was it. And they just moved on. But everything was one take. Wow. That was it. And I, the first day I was like, I'm never doing this ever <laughs> again. If they don't fire me, if they, if I come, if they bring me back, I'll be surprised and I'll be grateful. Then they brought me back. And then each day I got more and more comfortable with the environment. And the people were very supportive they the people i was working opposite uh, of they said do you want to work through the lines because i had a lot of uh like succession jargo jargon where it's just mm. it's just business stuff oh, yeah. stock market stuff nope i wasn't raised with any of that shit so i was just like what does this mean and they were they just like let's work through it and on our other break we had a break and they were like we'll stay here and work on it with you i was like but you guys need a break they're like don't worry about it like, let's just go through it. And we did. And boom, done. And we'll see what stays in. So I'm in like three uh, episodes, I think. Three or four episodes. Awesome. I can't remember. Oh, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I want to ask you, Scott, don't forget, you can ask me questions. Um, I... <laughs> I was about to. I, I, okay, you want me to no, show go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, have you, um, since you've been uh, primarily a principal actor for the theater, because I do I do tend to like rein it back because this is an understudy podcast. Yes. Um, about the art of understudying. Yes. But have you um, <laughs> watched an understudy oh. of yours perform okay. your role? Thank you. Yes, I did um, Elliot, A Soldier's Fugue at the Steppenwolf Garage. Um, it was Teatro Vista and Rivendell Theater Company uh, working with Steppenwolf Garage to do it there. Kiara ended up being a Pulitzer Prize finalist with that play and then got the Pulitzer, I think with another, she had three plays about the Elliot, about Elliot, a cousin of hers who was a soldier from Philadelphia. And she wrote the book for In the Heights. Um, and so Desmond Borges was my understudy. And so, he was understudying me. He had just graduated from DePaul, which is where Lisa was directing. So, so the understudying at Steppenwolf was the beginning of year uh, year two, around year two of being in Chicago. Uh, leading into year three was the Goodman. And then I started doing principal roles. And Elliot was one of them, was like one of my first ones. I just, just joined Teatro Vista. They invited me to be a company member. 
um, I got uh, I got cast, and Desmond was cast uh, right out of DePaul. And me, I was like a huge. Oh no, I had done. Uh, what is that? Miguel Pinero play Short Eyes. I had done Short Eyes, and then I had done um, uh, uh, Elliot. So I was starting to get my sort of thing of being a principal actor, understanding my process, working through that. Um, and Desmond was my understudy, and he was a very eager understudy, meaning this motherfucker brought so much like peppy positive energy i'm like three years into my meisner stuff so i'm a curmudgeon i'm like an 80 i'm a 60 year old just grumpy grumpy man who's like why is he happy why is he like joyous life is horrible bukowski like i'm just like i'm just in that phase of my life which is like perfect chicago and and i, and I just turned i then got into the whole like is he going to fuck with me? Like, is he trying to throw me off my game? And he didn't. He never did. He was being, he was being big hearted. I was just that person at that age, mm -hmm. that time yeah. in my life, I should say. And so there was a thing that we would have at Teatro Vista that I was told, which is understudies get one performance. And was it consistent that understudies always got a performance? No, but I was being very like nudge nudged of he should get a performance. And I was like, holding on to it so hard of no 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 and he, i finally was like i need to just let it go and i and then it was the whole thing of do i watch do i watch him perform and i just was like just watch like what's the big deal sit in the back because it was it was a thrust situation and just watch and first couple of minutes because it's like a whole like it starts off with being in your towel and you're not wearing anything else underneath, and then you change, uh, like putting a white tidy whities doing exercise, all this stuff, and then you start getting dressed right there in front of everyone into a soldier. And I'm just there, like, I'm, I'm gonna be, <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm being supportive, but this is me being supportive, there being open and available. And it's like, I'm sitting like a, a just a grumpy old man. <laughs> and then, like, he makes me laugh. And then I just like relax and I relax, I drop my arms, I'm not crossing my arms anymore. And I'm like lost in the story. And by the end, I realized I'd approached that character with the same heaviness of, of, of who, who, where I was at that time in my life. When in the story, he is a 19-year-old, optimistic, just life-loving person who becomes a soldier and then it, it, it shits on him, what he sees over there. And I was playing, I felt like I was playing the end at the beginning. And, and it was because I didn't have proper technique at the time where I was in the, again, just even how I described holding on to the role and not letting Desmond go on. It was this thing of, I need to get to a place of like horrific thoughts and I need to hold on to that thing so that I can be ready for the big moment, quote unquote moment. I can't like let it go. And I just do everything to stay there. And so I saw him have this levity and I was like, oh, that's what I need to do. Mm -hmm. And I need to, I need to just trust that things will shift. And if they don't, I, I, I guess I'll learn and just see like what I need to do differently. But that levity and that, that freedom needs to be there from the top. And I thanked him. I said, I, man, I learned so much watching you. And he, I, and I think he's such a, he has a great sense of, sense of self that he never would have thought, is he fucking with me? Like, he just was like, oh, awesome, great, awesome. Hey, can't wait to watch, can't wait to watch you again. And if I was in his position, I'd be like, what do you mean by that? What do you mean? What do you mean? It's great. Are you being sarcastic? Are you being passive aggressive? Like, what's going on? Yeah. Um, and so um, I did, and I it, it shifted my performances from that place on. And, um, and so that's my uh, understudy, uh, uh, someone going on for me and, and what I sort of, uh, got from that and and also the other thing that was part of that experience was that you know all this stuff about chris jones with the Chi chicago tribune and he wasn't the head reviewer critic at the time and i remember people talking about the review and at the time i think i read reviews and they talked about everyone was like ah oh, fuck him like blah 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 horrible i don't know this that 
And I was, I read it and I remember walking away just being like, ah, well, whatever, who cares? And then all he could he became head critic and, you know, he's had, he's been divisive in so many ways and things that he's, he has written and said and tweeted and posted on social media. <laughs> and, and so I walked away for, you know, over 15 years of being like, wow, he just always writes horrible things about me. And I was sharing this story uh, last year, just last year. And I was like, you know what? What did he say? I never, I can't remember what he said about me that he ripped me up or ripped me apart. And I reread the review and he was very nice. <laughs> he said very kind things about me. But the overall, his criticism of the play was, a, a, you know, a, not as nice, but it wasn't like horrible. But holy cow, did I, going back to this thing of me having this like mentality of, I want to be, make sure everyone's okay. I walked away with what everyone else, how everyone else took it. I didn't want to feel as if I maybe got something nice said. Two things can exist. Someone can say something nice about me and they can criticize the show. Mm -hmm. Those two things can exist. But at that yeah. time, I didn't think it could exist. I, or maybe I didn't want it to exist. I don't know. But I just went with, oh, that guy who's just, he was like not fair and blah, blah, blah. I completely walked away with a narrative that made me feel as if he's always been very critical of me. So that's the other experience that comes from that. Um, the other uh, uh, understudy story is um, I wrote, a, a aside from my solo play, Panada for a Dream, I wrote a, another play called Don Chipotle. And it was uh, produced uh, at the, what's that downtown theater that the city owns? Uh, D Case. Um, D Case. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's that, it's that storefront, though. DK mm -hmm. storefront. Theater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where the hot text is. And... Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And so my play was produced and we had an understudy, one understudy, Debbie Baños. And she understudied five actors. Yeah. <laughs> we paid her as much as the principals. I think we did like $1,000 each or something like that. And she was very willing. She had just moved to Chicago. I knew her because I had workshopped that same play in our Arkansas. I had done a workshop to play there. And so we got to know each other. And I'm always very like, if you move somewhere, like I can give you guidance of where to go, who to look for, what podcast to listen to. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I do. I totally do. It's not, it's not a lie. And uh, she understudied it. And um, she ended up having to go on. And there was music. There were songs in that in that play. There was it was played with music, and this woman like didn't miss a beat. She I always checked in with her, and she was cool as a cucumber. If she was ever panicking, she never let any of us know. Like she had the the people worked with her, but she went on, and it was like didn't didn't miss a beat at all. And I just commend her for being able to do that, never voicing anything to me. If she voiced something to someone, I never heard it. And I've never asked to be like, hey, did you, how was that for you? I was always just very appreciative. Be like, thank you. Like you were fantastic and you did so much and we threw so much at you. And that was not an easy show uh, to, um, to understudy, especially when it's one person uh, doing it. Yeah. So um She's one of my my people that I I don't forget something like that. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. We'll take a break. Uh, we'll be right back with Juan Villa. All right, we are back with Juan Villa, uh, and now it is time for the breakdown. And our question for today is uh well it's kind of complicated so i'm gonna lay it all out um so for the show that i just worked on uh i promised myself to live faster by helen handbag productions it's been probably the best understudy experience i've ever had um we had rehearsals uh during while the cast was in tech we were in rehearsals um and we've had consistent rehearsals throughout and for a non-union show this is you know, pretty special. Um, the way that we've handled the understudy performances is, I've never heard of this before. Um, they worked a performance uh, of 
for each of the understudies into the schedule of the show. So we would go in with the principal actors, as opposed to doing a one-night understudy performance. Um, And so the question is, would you prefer to have a guaranteed performance where you're going in with the principal cast, or would you prefer to have an understudy performance to yourself? Oh, what do you mean to yourself? Well, with oh, the other understudies. With the other with the understudies. Other understudies. <laughs> That's oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so being inclusive or, se- you know, just, like, separating everyone. You know, it's right. interesting. I was The way you just described it, uh, I've seen a, it's I don't even know what to call it here in L.A., but it's alternative casts. So, in a way, they're, they're understanding each other. Uh, except, who knows when their reviewer sees it. So, what it is, is, like, there's two casts for any show because of you know all the stuff that gets shot and people's careers oh, or whatever sure. so they're just like you guys get these two uh, uh these two performances on this week you all get these two and then we'll just keep rotating it so you're mm. guaranteed whatever it is two performances a week and it's just a they will be like a cast c cast or whatever b cast and decast. It's a whole yeah. thing. And that's there. often done when children are in the cast too, especially uh-huh. if there's like a group of children, they'll always have like two, not always, but often will have two sets. Mm. I like the idea of of what I just said, which doesn't answer your question directly, <laughs> but it makes me just go, oh, oh man, that's good. That's, tr- that's tricky. I'm like, oh, but I want to be with my understudy people who I'm rehearsing with. But I also like this idea of new energy being thrown, like just sort of like, oh, it's going to be new because I'm working with people who I haven't been, in theory, rehearsing with. So that's my off the cuff comment. And I'm still a caretaker. (laughs) Is that a yes, you would like the the The, rotating (laughs) insertion of understudies? That. That that's the that's my answer, and it's not my final answer. As I I process, it. what about the other side too? Like, how do you feel as a principal with working with the different understudies for the different roles, like over the course of the run? Like, how do you how you think what what do you, you think? You about know that? what you know because I'm I'm learning a lot about myself throughout while talking about all this stuff. Is in that position, if I'm principal, I'm just like oh whoever whoever goes on is whoever whoever it is. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that makes me go. And I think it goes back to like your first observation, Alana, with what I said about understudy actor and just like how it's still an actor and how I was like, yeah, yeah, you're still an understudy actor. It's like, wait, 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 wait. Like don't make it seem like it's a a, a lesser than thing. And, and I think there's something about being principal where I go, yeah, whoever, if an understudy performs with me, I'm all for it. But if I'm an understudy, I'm like, Oh, I don't want the families to fight. (laughs) <laughs> I'm not choosing one side over the other. That's what happens to me. Yeah. It's literally, I'm like, oh no, I left my house for this reason because I don't want to be in the middle of shit anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but no one's yelling at me. No one's doing anything. This is me, you know, in my head. Yeah. yeah. Scott, how was that? What do you think of it having experienced it? Um, It was, uh, it, it's been an interesting experiment. Um, because, uh, I also assistant directed this show. Um, so I've also been on the other side of the table. Um, and, uh, I could see how it was kind of, um, a scheduling clusterfuck, (laughs) um, uh, just in terms of trying to get it ready. And then like, we have to call in the principal actors a little bit earlier for those days because we could have, so we can have a put in. Um, thank God we didn't try to schedule put-ins, like, outside of that. Um, I think that would have been terrifying. Um, and, uh, I think, I think it does give another level of, like, this is a serious performance. Like, you are going in for an actual show, um, not just an understudy show. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that part of it I love. Um, and especially for me, um, going in with that cast, um, I knew so many of these people beforehand, um, and, and, uh, they're all solid actors. I was very excited to work with all of them. So, um, for me, um, actually I think even, uh, JD Caudill, our director, um, I think they might've 
like offered me the understudy with that in mind that I would be working that I would have a guaranteed performance with the other actors um and so uh so I liked that as an actor from a like production perspective I could definitely see um why an understudy performance would be preferable just in terms of scheduling <laughs> pretty much um and also, there's something to be said for the bonds that the understudies make with each other um, and the show that they've created together um, being slightly different from the principles. Um, and so so I'm a little I'm a, uh, uh, I was talking to it uh, about it with uh, Kim Bowler, um, who's in the show. And, uh, you know, she was like, well, at the factory, we do you know, an underside performance and it's like the biggest, uh, you know, sold out night. Uh, everybody comes to it. Um, and, and I did actually do a show at the factory like five years ago and, and, uh, had that experience and it is really nice. Like it is really nice to have that, like, Hey, this is a special night. All the actors are here. Um, and, and that energy is, is different. Um, so it's it's hard for me to say if I, I like one more than the other, um, probably because I experienced it from both sides. Um, so was that your first time being on that side of the table while understudying the same show? That yes, yeah, for sure. Um, I've never I've never done that, and that that was a whole uh, you know uh, specific thing just because um, the actor who uh i was understudying his name's david serta he's the artistic director of uh yeah. Helen handbag yeah, yeah um he's great and um he's kind of a star in like the so, certain theater circles <laughs> um yeah. so and and deservedly so he's been in almost all of their shows and he's hilarious um he wrote most of their shows too um so like going into it i knew that i was auditioning only for an understudy role um and i kind of wanted a principal role uh it would have been a different role in the show entirely um that i was up for but uh that didn't shake out um and so when i got the offer for the understudy i was like you know i'm i'm down for this cuz i love this play it's like this queer science fiction adventure thing it's campy and so crazy yeah. it's so much fun um i i love this script and i really want to work on it i'd never worked with jd um and i was just like you know what like could i also assistant direct on this just so i feel like i have like i don't know some skin in the game like i'm like i'm making a difference for the show Mm -hmm. um and uh and jd was totally cool with that uh we we like kind of tangentially known each other for several years and this is like our first time like actually working together and it went beautifully well i would say i'm gonna take a turn if that's okay uh a, an entire understudy cast performance always strikes me as sort of a showcase mm -hmm. which just feels different you know, because we often make the effort, like when we're when we're having those, we're producing those, we're like invite, you know, all your people, and then invite your agents, you know, your representatives and representation and all that, and then it's this one night, and while that sounds awesome at Factory, like that, it's such a big night, but then it's still it's like a showcase, mm -hmm. and a, I think like a a second class prize, ish, yeah, yeah. you know, whereas getting a guaranteed performance with the principal cast is like, that's the work, that's what you're doing the work for. Mm -hmm. And if it is such, if it's set up in a way that like every understudy gets that opportunity, like that is part of the plan. I think that I like that. Cause sometimes understudies are guaranteed performances because the principal knows they're gonna be out when they mm -hmm. um, accept their offer, you know? And so it's like, you're going on this weekend or whatever, but to guarantee each individual a performance with the principal cast when that's the point of their work as understudies, like they're not, aside from that showcase-ish performance, then they're not, that's, that doesn't, um, 
that's not the show necessarily. Now I get it. Like, yes, they do the show, you know, like it's, it is, but like, that's not, you don't go into that excited to work uh, to do the show with the rest of the understudies. When you accept an understudy, you intend to be seen by the same public who sees the principals mm -hmm. at some point. That's what, that's, that's what you want. That's why you're there. That's why you work hard. And so I don't perceive it necessarily as a, a lesser thing in, um, you know, like it's not worth anything. I don't mean, you know, I'm not trying to suggest that this isn't worth anything, but I think there, if, if it can be done in the way that you all did it, I think there's more, that's a little bit more exciting. Um, yeah. And I, I think it's, uh, it prepares the actors for like really seriously fucking doing it, which right. I think has been kind of a common thing for the actors that we've interviewed that and personally in my life that when the production doesn't seem particularly serious about the understudies the understudies don't put in the work because they don't feel supported yeah. um so i think that's a really great way to be like no you're going on like you're doing this uh we believe in you yeah. you can do this yeah um, it, it's a uh it's it's interesting. Like I I I will be asking this question to other people because I I'd be very curious what what they say. But I think like people get cast in different cities for different productions for different reasons, and and I've directed also. And so to could I look back and go, well, could we have had two casts, or could we have had an understudy cast and a principal cast, and said that either one is can do a a, a performance? It's like well, maybe through enough rehearsal. So then it's about do you if you make time for one, you're not giving time to the other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'll say this. There was a show that was going to happen that is and it was a one person show. And we definitely discussed just doing a double cast. And so basically they would be understudying each other. And I think it would happen more, particularly with a small cast, if um, um, if Jeff wasn't in the picture, right? Because an individual has to have X amount of performances oh, right. or whatever to be considered, right? And so that makes it more oh, challenging. Oh, Jeff Awards. I yes. thought it was a person. I was like, <laughs> I don't know who Jeff is, but Scott is laughing at Jeff. Right. Yeah, Jeff Awards, You don't remember right? Jeff? <laughs> you know, oh, Juan, you gotta G -E remember Jeff. Yeah. You know, so that, that makes, you know, cause it's been, you know, we've talked about it, you know, for different things, but like, you know, the principals want that opportunity to be, have a nomination, you know? Mm -hmm. So and, the number of, have... of performances of the actor, not per, not performances of the production. It's like twofold, right? So it's like the production itself has to have X number, right? But consider if, you know, the, the committee is coming to the show. Oh, they're seeing, yeah. Right. Like who are who are they gonna see and how do they make a collective decision if they're seeing different actors mm -hmm. across wow. the, the, run I've of the not, show? I've not. I'm gonna ask about that just because of the alternative cast thing here, because people have won a winner. Like Millie Langford is the one who introduced me to that here when she did Native Son here. I don't know if you, yeah. you either of you know Millie. Oh, and, I absolutely know. Yeah, I yeah. love and, her. And lo exactly, exactly. <laughs> She's the best. And so she she did Native Son and it was an alternative cast and I was like what and she's like yeah it's a thing they do here so that there's never a thing of concern if someone books something like it's accepted as part of the culture like yeah. you are clearly want here for a reason and if you're doing the play great and we want to make sure you have you can go and w the show is taken care of yeah. but I don't know what they did with the whole that what you just mentioned because they have their own awards over here so i'm gonna ask because mm -hmm. that's a damn good point that i would not uh, have been aware of and, and i'll say on the production side financially hey it's the high school musical formula the bigger yeah. the cast the more people come to see the show yeah. that means more butts in seats mm -hmm. so you get technically twice as many potential audience members meaning people who come to support yeah, their, their, their people so there's that side to it that is like all right but i am curious in chicago or even new york of how that 
would fly. Yeah, because I don't know the, you know, all I, I just only know the Jeff rules, right? Which are, you know, they have to agree, however many of them have to agree on a particular component of the show being excellent. So maybe seven people have to agree. I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> or, but I mean, like, or if, or if but like, people can be, like, that. like, I'm trying to imagine the scenario where it's, let's say both alternative cast leads are, oh, they're amazing. And can they both be nominated? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for and the I, same role. <laughs> I think there's some like I mean the only precedent I can think of that is a, like Matilda or Billy Elliot, where you have kids that are like sharing the role. Um, yeah. I can't think of any um, circumstances though where, but they should be. I mean, if if that's the uh, production's intent that A and B cast are equal um i i don't see why they couldn't be nominated together in the same way that like the matildas and the billy elliott interesting yeah they were they're they're gonna have to think about and talk about how they can do that because they should what a divisive (laughs) question scott (laughs) i love it you know um uh i'll also say this and, and this is kind of related to something you were talking about earlier was um I think understudies too usually don't have uh, an MRE clause, uh, a more remunerative, more remunerative employment. Yeah, employment. There we go. Yeah. Um, uh, you you know, so it's like, oh well, you're the understudy. Uh, you're just at our beck and call, uh, uh, and and it's like I think that's something that for me personally as an understudy, like I'd like to have in my contracts. Um, because again, you're being paid less than the other actor, um, especially in non equity theater. It's just like, you know, if if I book something on Chicago Fire, you gotta let me go do it. And if you don't let me go do it, I have to quit, and that sucks for everybody. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's it, you know, I I when I brought up to my team about understudying uh, on Broadway, I asked that question, and and. I, and they didn't have – they were saying you will have to be available if you book something. Because I was like – in my head, I thought uh, understudies get an MRE also, and I can be available to do other things right. while being available at night and not thinking. I'm like, well, I should get the same right. But then they would say – my team said, well, you're the understudy. Like, who else are they going to go to? I was like, well, but what if I test positive? Like, they cancel the show. I don't know. I've not asked, so I wasn't aware that there wasn't – no one on my team said officially – there is no MRE. I mm. asked, is there one? And they're like, well, we're not sure, but we would think that you wouldn't be able to. Um, so I've not done the legwork to find out. If We've that is given the case. them to understudies at Intero mm. Band. Really? Mm. It, never go, even, man. it never even occurred to me not to, to be honest. <laughs> be, like, I, like I, once we started doing them, we didn't, we haven't been doing it from the beginning, but you know, about midway through our tenure. And, um, and so my setup for the contract are the set, you know, I'm, I, it's the same pages, but I'm changing the details for each job, right? The, the, the pay, the, the role, et cetera. Um, but never once did I think, oh, they're an understudy. Let me pull out this R, R, me, R, R, me, <laughs> this R, me. I never did that. Um, Way so. to go though. No, I think that's, I think, I think, I mean, that's just artist friendly and it's just the realities of what what our cost of living is and opportunities that just lead uh to more opportunities so kudos to to entire bank for for doing that because that's yeah. that's fantastic it's time for props <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying not to make any noise <laughs> i love it i love it <laughs> so we hear you got some more props to give out. <laughs> I do. I do. You heard correct. Uh, obviously, I mentioned Desmond Borges. I mentioned uh, Debbie Baños, the Baths. And um, I recently in L.A., I saw um, Josh Bywater. Uh, he, he is a Chicago actor who I met who's been living in L.A. He's on uh, Somebody Somewhere. That uh, that half hour show is fantastic on HBO. And and uh, he went on uh, for a play here in, in L.A. And... Uh, he was fantastic, and it was great to. And I have no idea the guy that he filled in for. I guess he does a lot of TV. 
And it's like one of those where I'm like, whatever, I don't care about that guy. Like I just, I just saw what you did. I have nothing to compare it to. And I thought you were, uh, you were great. So uh, Josh Bywater uh, is who I think of. And, and I, I want to share this second story. I won't say where it is, but um, and maybe you've heard this story. It was at a theater, uh, a reputable theater, where there were understudies, and the understudy was going to go on. Um, and they had friendships with celebrities. And this is a horror story. <laughs> this, is a, this is a horror story. And they had, it's already like way later in the run. So they've been rehearsing and doing all that stuff. And they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm ready. Even though they were shaky in rehearsals, but they were like, I feel good. And the show goes because these celebrities, I mean, these are celebrities. I'm saying a list, not a minus, not a, maybe a plus. But not me. <laughs> These are celebrities. And they're in the audience to support their friend. Like I would. We would for our friends. And they are lost. And the God mic comes on to feed the line. They say the line. They don't know the next line. God mic. Like it just kept happening. Until it was a, we got to stop the show. No. And we got to give this person a script to continue with the show. And uh, and they did. And I think about that person because I don't doubt that they felt they could do it. Yeah. I don't doubt that if my friends were these people who I've been friends with, like how we've talked about friends that we just know because we're, when we started... And they're in the audience. I have no idea this person actually is able to, or if they just were like, "Holy shit, this is what it, this is my version of what they've been at in their careers, mm -hmm. and I'm not able to," or they just never were good at it. All I know is that the theater stopped understudying after that because they just were like, "Why are we wasting money?" <laughs> so that when I did a show at this place, that we had no understudy, and to the point that. There was an, an actor who was not up to par, and that person was fired right before tech. And there was no understudy, and they had to do a search to have someone jump in. And the person who came in had more experience as a, a theater actor, and they flew. Like, they flew with it, and they did a fantastic job. And um, I, co I commend that person who was not an understudy but came in to replace someone. And that person's a uh, Kate Campbell Scott, and she's fantastic. I'm a huge fan. Uh, yeah. So those are my like additional stories. Uh, to, and I know I have more, but those are the ones that I <laughs> every actor's nightmare was just like, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's um. Well, I, I don't. I might have trouble sleeping tonight. From yes. That story. <laughs> yes. And you, and, and it, it should keep you up. Uh, and I think it should just keep you on your toes. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Oh, that's great. <laughs> uh, so, like, is there anything in the, like, we, so we, you've talked about General Hospital and they will have long aired and maybe they'll, there'll be some reruns, but is there anything? Uh, I, I guess the General Hospital episodes uh, will have aired uh, by the time this comes out. Um, I had just done, um, it, it just went through the whole Oscar run uh, as a film called To Leslie. Uh, I, I have a, I have a nice scene with Andrea Riseborough in that. Um, so that's out. So I hopefully it makes it to streamers. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and uh, an amazing set, amazing people. She was fantastic. Congratulations on being oh, thank an <laughs> Oscar nominated <laughs> film. Like that's yeah, amazing. I know. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And um, um, I, uh, you can find online cause they've all aired. It's an audio, an audio series, an animated series called Little Demon. Um, Seth Kirshner and Darcy Flower create, co-created it. And uh, Dan Harmon was an EP uh, on it. Uh, it's with Danny DeVito, Aubrey Plaza. That's out on, um, I think, Hulu. Though mm -hmm. It was on HBO Max, I think, for a little while. But I think it's back on Hulu. Um, uh, that's there. Uh, and I play a f I have a few episodes in that. Nice. And that's great. Uh, I have a couple of audio, an audio podcast that's about to be released. Uh, it's with Minnie Driver and Jack Kilmer, which is Val Kilmer's son. So it takes place in 1970s, um, 1970s New York City vampires. 
cool. And it's wow. it's it's uh it's it's whacked out. I had a blast. Uh, they were off. They were just great. And so it's it's just a lot of fun. I haven't heard anything on because the episodes haven't been released, but they'll be out. Um, I was just just because you know the ups and downs of this industry. I was just um, uh, released from a play. Uh, that was going to go up, and uh, I was excited about uh, potentially doing it. But uh, the reasoning makes sense. I'm sure uh, – uh, are you a company member of of, of, of a company, Scott? Uh, I have been in the past, yeah. You have been. So, and, and Ilana, with Interabang, you're still a company member, right? Yeah. You know, you have the rules of com- of how many company members in a show. Oh, sure. Ish, I guess, ish. Each company will do that where you're 50%. Or at least one. Uh, there's a thing like that, and I'm glad that I was told that it's like, hey man, they loved you, but it's a company thing, and these other folks did enough to to, to take the over the hump. And I was like, yeah. hey man, I appreciate the truth, and um, uh, so uh, you won't see me in that, but <laughs> I share that because we don't know what happens. Between now and then, right? If 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 uh, it, it, if he was being honest of how pe- they took it, which I sounds like I think he he's not going to bullshit me about it. Then you never know what happens where people book things. I know we're on a strike coming, multiple strikes. Who knows how long it'll last? It might change. So yeah. maybe by then I'll be like, "Hey, I'm in that play that I mentioned. <laughs> so uh, put it back in." No. <laughs> right. Um. Uh. Da, 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 I don't. Oh, there. The, yes, there's um, a short film thanks to Bezad Beza, Dabu who uh, recommended me. Uh, that's gonna. It's called the Last Days of the Lab. Uh, it's by Maria Alvarez and it's part of the Rising Voices Initiative, I believe. Uh, through Lena Waits Company, uh, oh, through cool. Hillman Grad, and so that's gonna have a screening at Tribeca, uh, nice. in in June. And then we'll see what happens uh, after that uh, with uh, with that. Um, and I think I think that's it. But if something else <laughs> okay. something else changes, because uh, I've had enough experience with being pinned for stuff, and then you get released, and it's just like, oh, all right, I was close. Oh well, moving yeah. on. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> uh, Juan, we like to end uh, the podcast with just the question of like, what is some advice that you would give to either your younger self or to actors who are uh, coming out of college now or, or entering the field um, that you wish you knew when you were starting out? I, you know, when I had, I first lived in Chicago in 2002 to 2007. I left, but went back to New York City, then came back to Chicago. And I approached my second time in Chicago very differently from my first time. Which was, I, I'm not going to live in myself to the people that I work with. I had somehow created this habit of, I can only work with these companies or mm-hmm. these specific people. And I didn't allow myself to open up the circle or the, open up the people that I could potentially work with. And so I, that's what I would say to, to folks is, you know, go, uh, it's, just, it's the general rules, which is don't be an asshole um have a good work ethic and uh, uh be kind to be kind to people and you know show up uh, and if you're late you're late uh don't be late again if you're late again holy shit you better get your shit together and uh get a uh, planner get a planner <laughs> <laughs> use this thing called a smartphone uh. <laughs> which i resisted use trans transitioning to a smartphone and i can't believe it once i learned how to use it cuz be me being a technophobe, I just was like, oh, this is amazing. Why didn't I use it before? But um, no, just like just do go out there and meet folks. Like uh, put yourself out there, watch readings, watch plays. You just never know who you're going to see. And then you see them later and you can say, hey, I saw you in that reading. And then they just, you know, it, our egos love that stuff. We, <laughs> don't, we don't know who's watching anything. So go out there without expecting anything in return. It's just you integrating yourself into, into the art scene, and that's how I, that's how I look at it. And then you you will work your way up, but you know you don't have to, you don't have to demean yourself or be lesser than, than anyone. Um, and so that's that's what I would say. And just try to work as much as possible 
in the beginning because you're not going to I don't think you learn your true craft until you are consistently working and seeing what's not working. Mm. And then you learn from other folks. Um, so that's what I would say to folks. Uh, and that's what I do say uh, to folks. I, I sometimes uh, give talks to different programs. And those are the things that I, I talk about along with sharing finances, financial stuff. Educate yourself on finances. Like taxes. <laughs> yeah. I did six years of no taxes and I lived in fear because I do that to myself. I just did that to myself. And the thing is, by the time I did them, they were garnishing my checks, rightfully so. Oh, yeah. And then it was like, I got a lot of money back. Like, I could have had money that I didn't know I had access to because I had, as is a constant theme, I had built a narrative of what, what it, what's going to happen and I'm going to get arrested. All the, and, and I just don't want to go for this big job because then... I'm going to draw attention and it just was, it was just endless. I just coming from a family of, of, of criminals. <laughs> it was just like, <laughs> we didn't even talk about that, but uh, I just, no, do your taxes, man. Do your fucking taxes. Like, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I want, that's wonderful. I love that. That's awesome. Uh, well, I thank you so much. This was so great. That's I'm so nice. glad we I'm finally glad. got to do this. Yes. I appreciate uh, all of this, uh, Scott and Alana. Like seriously, yeah. so. Um, See you yeah, around. Thank you, thank you. so much. Take care. All right, Take pleasure. Care. We hope you enjoyed our conversation with Juan Villa, and that it gives you deeper insight into the art of understudying. To send us a question or give us a suggestion of anyone we should interview, email us at understudypodcast at gmail dot com, or hit us up at understudypod on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We want to thank all our Patreon subscribers, especially Marcella Huff and Stanley Sapa. If you want to support the show, head over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash understudypod. Our theme song and all the other music you hear is from Laura McKenzie. Our episodes are edited by Scott and produced by mostly Scott and me just a little bit. <laughs> thank you so much for listening if you liked it please hit subscribe on your podcast player of choice and tell your friends if you hated it tell your enemies and their parents their stupid parents they suck <laughs> <laughs> bye, bye. <laughs>